I'm Liz Willem, the editor-in-chief of the Heckinger Report. We're based here at Teachers College, and I found out about this movie when I was actually moderating another film called Unlikely, and somebody on the panel whispered to me, you got to see Personal Statement. It's even better. And they were right, and um, I got in touch with Julie soon after, and we decided to partner because we are um, an independent nonprofit news outlet, and our stories appear all over the country, but these are issues we've been writing about for years that she showed in the film, and... Um, the, the, the lack of guidance counselors in New York City public schools, the complicated pathways to college, the difficulty with financial aid and finding that form that you said you never knew you could hate so, a form for so much. Uh, for so much. So um, I'm going to, I'm so excited to be here with this team. We've been showing the film in Texas and last, this week we were in um, San Diego, California. We're going to be showing it at the New School Venture Fund. And aside from asking some questions for, the, for these these guys who, you know, you kind of fall in love with them when you see the film and really start rooting for them. Um, I want to, the audience to have an opportunity to ask questions too. We know you have a lot of great questions and we're gonna get all the answers for you. So if you text the word film to F-I-L-M to 347-658-5764, the number will be shown on the screen behind you and we're gonna get to answer all your questions. Great, so starting with Enoch, um, wow. Your story in that film and, and what you went through is really um, incredible, and you were so honest in telling it. We'd love to know a little bit since the film what kind of impact you, you feel like it's been having, if, if any, and why it's needed so much, this, this idea of more guidance counselors and the help that, that you didn't really get going, through going on your road to college. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like, all right, so ever since I started to travel with the film, we all started to travel with the film, I would come and, and we'd screen the film and people would come up to us and express their, their, their feelings and their feedback on it and it would all be like just positivity and, and they would tell us that they were motivated through our stories. So I got to instantly understand the, the impact there, like as soon as we screened the film. And then I would wish, I hope, and I want that the film to show audiences across the world, across the country, that they have, I want the film to influence crowds to know that they have the ability to be the voice and to be the change in the issues that's occurring in our community, you know? Like, I want, the, I want people to understand that this film proves to you that we have that power, you know? And I also would like for FASPA to be a little bit simpler. That feel, <laughs> I feel like that'd be really, really ideal. Um, one change that I, I think that would be like imperative, it would be like if, uh, if a college wants an important document from a financial institution, the college should directly contact that institution for it and then it'd be sent all the way over to them instead of having me or just students ac around the country just traveling and figuring out these absurd things. So, yeah. Thanks. And, and Christine, you, <laughs> you were an activist even in high school to begin with. And now, if you don't mind my saying, are you not about to graduate from the new school in a few weeks? Wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so you have, have now have something, a, a, a real topic to, an, another topic to, to be involved in as an activist. I'm curious how you are seeing the impact and the change of this film and what you'd like it to be. Well, first I would like to thank you all for coming and enjoying the film, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but um, I feel like the impact that I saw with the film is that um, more people are starting to talk about this topic. Um, is uh, This film is very impactful in the way that it opens this life that not many are aware that is so common. Like, this is not just a New York City problem, this is a na nationwide problem. And um, as we travel with the film, I've met a lot of people that had the privilege of not experiencing this, but wanting to do something about it. And then people that are like, wow, this is my story, that your mom is my mom. Like, <laughs> but um, um, with this film, we're trying to also reach out to stakeholders and we're soon next week going to DC to talk to Senate about the film, and we have made um, reforms that hopefully Julie gets to touch on. Um, but in the 
in the film, you saw like a snippet of me being at the city um, city hall budget hearing on education reform, and um, we were able to make a reform that mandate New York City to count all the guidance counselors in New York City, which we didn't really have that data, but that data is very important to know what schools have what and what are already in place. Um, but with this film, I really hope that viewers see the potential and the power that young people have. Like, if we really have students' interests in mind when we do things, when we make um, reforms or we're at budget hearings or when we know people that can do something about it, we should talk to the students and always be in communication with them because we know what we're going through and what we need. And we should also like offer opportunities for us young people to sit at the table because we should be, <laughs> we should be. It, sh it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense for um, people with power to make changes for us and not have us involved. So, Rudy, talking about like potential solutions, tell us a little bit about the programs you, you're overseeing here at Teachers College that are working to train more guidance counselors to get background in actual college counseling. The typical um, guidance counselor is often overwhelmed with so many other issues. How are you trying to change that? So I manage the college advising program here at TC, which is funded by the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. Um, and our hope is to actually uh, increase access for underserved communities to get into college. So in New York City, in un underserved schools, you have one guidance counselor for 800 students. And they're typically spending seven minutes or less in the entire senior year doing college advising. So clearly, right, I mean, there's an, there's an issue. And we go to a private school where you have a dedicated college advisor starting from eighth grade, like sort of helping the kid uh, with access sort of get into uh, colleges. So we were hoping actually to sort of um, make access to education easier. So we decided, designed an online curriculum and we've had 868 registrants since its inception. Um, and our focus primarily actually is to look at Look, have the counselor look inward before they can help outward. So actually understanding your own assumptions and biases when you're working with underserved populations. So for example, um, there's a lot of research out there that when it comes to African American children or black children in the classroom, a lot of teachers and guidance counselors just automatically assume that they're not going to college. So that's where they're starting off because of their racial bias. So our program is actually designed to look at how can we decolonize a little bit of that education. The second thing, we spend a whole module on the FAFSA because it is a beast. It's very difficult to sort of navigate. And a lot of time, college counselors don't know how to work the FAFSA. So we are hoping that we can actually provide a lot of like hands-on education and also then couple it with some introspection. That's great. Um, Julia, the, the audience has a great question, and while I want you to talk about the impact, uh, I'd like to, I think we can integrate it into this one, because I know that a lot of our conversations have been about impact, as you see it. You've, you've also created an impact campaign that goes along with, with this film, and we've been writing stories about the lack of guidance counselors all over the country to accompany that. Um, Someone for the audience wants to know, has the city and the Department of Education done anything to make it easier for students to help applying to colleges since this film? And I do want to say we invited the chancellor, and we were hoping to ask him directly. Um, he couldn't make it, but you, you may want to give a crack at how you could answer that one. So the question is, has the city done anything since the film differently? Yeah. So I don't, again, we, we, we really want to share this film with the, with the New York City Schools Chancellor, um, with folks in, um, you know, who work on post-secondary uh, readiness and, and, and counseling um, for the DOE. And we have not had a chance. And I have a feeling there's a bunch of people in this room who can help us get that audience. Um, we're really happy to be here. Um, to share the film with you all. We have an impact campaign, and it is precisely to use the film to get it in front of folks who are in a position to make decisions to say, we're going to close this crazy college guidance gap. What's the ratio average again? So nationally, 
uh, the average school counselor to student ratio is one to 464. And those counselors say they can spend 20% of their time on college and career counseling. So, you know, what you see in the film is how important it is, especially for uh, folk, you know, students who don't have someone at home who's been to college, um, to have it at school. So we're really using the film. We're going to Capitol Hill next week. We want to raise awareness about how important it is to provide the support that students need as they're going through this process. You see that they themselves were able to really make a difference and provide support, but they need to work in collaboration with adults. Um, and that's what we're trying to use the film for. We also, as Enoch said, we want to get it in front of students as much as possible because simply seeing the film, so many students have come up to them and said, you know, I am going through this and I am ready to give up on a daily basis because it's, there are so many hurdles, as you see in the film. But seeing my story in your story has made me decide that, no, I, I'm going to keep going. You did it. I can do it. So we want to get it to schools throughout the country. We want to get it to educators, to parents. Um, and then to decision makers, um, because you know, in 2013, for example, overnight, the school district in Philadelphia cut every single school counselor because they had they were in a budget crisis, and they were looking at the budget and saying, "What can we, what can we cut?" And they thought, "Oh, we can cut school counselors. We want to make sure that no one ever thinks that that is something to cut again. That it is absolutely not an extra. It's." 100% one of the most important roles being played in school buildings. Um, and we're, we're hoping to do that with the film. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and there's a couple of questions directed at, 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 at two, the two of you, not surprisingly, although I think some of them were answered in the film. Um, one of them is, what, what would have been your greatest challenges to transition to college outside of academics? I know it really sticks in my head that you went to Cortland and asked them for more money to help you with food and they basically turned you down. Yeah. That certainly was a challenge. Um, others that you'd like to talk about? Um, yes, uh, I spent two years at Cortland and I was like, I went through like an injury process and I was like red shirt for a little bit, I like dislocated my arm. So my first year and a half was a little bit rough for me and then I transferred over to QC to little, be a little bit closer to home, Queens College. And um, when I did, when I got into school, I was, I was instantly hit with freedom, right? Because in high school, we, everything was like on a strict schedule. You know, you're just you're there at a particular time. You have to go through your classes and you know listen well, to. Well, you were also teachers. taking care of your niece. Oh, yes, and and I, and she was also along with my daily routine. And I got to college, and I had just so much time on my hands, and I set up my schedule, and I had no idea what to do with myself. <laughs> I was like, all right, so there's two hours in the morning that I can nap extra, you know? I was trying to do all that extra stuff, and I'm trying to figure out what I should do, like getting my agenda sorted so I can be successful. So that was my like immediate challenge, was understanding time management. Christine, you said you got four hours of sleep a night in the film, but you, you persevered and you're almost done. What other challenges did you encounter? You did say that high school hadn't prepared you. Um, high school definitely did not prepare me when I got to college, I was met with like intellectual scholars, like readers that I have never heard of. But the students in my classroom, they they read it years ago, and like I had to play like the catch up game. But I feel like just I I knew why I was in college. Like I was always reminded about my purpose there, and I also had like community support. Um, I didn't really receive much support from the new school mostly because I didn't really know where to go. But um, another thing that I experienced in college that was a challenge for me was like the culture shock, being that New York City is like, we have the most segregated schools in the nation. So I was around black and Latino students, low income students, and then I'm in the new school where <laughs> there's like international students, students from all classes, all wealth, all walks of life, and like just having to be in that space and navigating through it, and sometimes feeling hopeless. I like found support in like programs like the Student of Color um, Weekly or like La Gente or like different programs that provided that space for me. And um, really, when you're when the the the, the counselors that are coming to you, 
they have, we were talking about how they're getting training and being guidance counselors for college. How is it that they can be a counselor and have so little idea of how to help students like these? Is there no other kind of training? Well, historically, so to be a guidance counselor in uh, New York State, you don't have to have any coursework in college advising. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a part of the certification process. So to your question about what is the state doing, so starting in 2020, they've made college readiness and preparation required curriculum in order to be certified to be a school counselor. So I think there is small sort of chipping away at the lack of uh, knowledge that our guidance counselors have. So to answer your question, yes, a lot of them, you know, did the FAFSA probably 10 years ago and it has changed dramatically and say they don't know how to access that. And I think we also saw it in with the coach in the movie, sort of talking to young adults from a different walk of life. How do you sort of bridge that gap, gap without coming across as patronizing, right? Or like not aware of your own privilege in that conversation. And as we all know, for young adults going to college, those like small encounters like really impact your ability and your um, desire to stick with that institution, right? It can be very isolating in that moment, I imagine, when someone in power is speaking to you without having any knowledge, right, of your experience. And like even to add on to that, like I've experienced like counselors at my school that were put in the position of, of being like a college counselor for the first time and me having to help them navigate through that because they they just don't, the, it's so complicated really. We had to go through training multiple, like for multiple periods of time. So yeah, I feel like if, um, you're gonna be like a counselor in a high school. We or it, the training shouldn't just be for guidance counselors. I feel like they should also be for staffs and for parents or for teachers, so that we can all have this sort of like environment. That's what it, we need to do. But guidance counselors are important. Yeah, they're really important, and, and um, I'm a New York City public school parent myself. It's probably why the film, one of the many reasons why it resonated. I have two boys who recently graduated from a public high school, and one of them never met their guidance counselor at all. Um, and so there's a really good question from the audience here, and, and, and Julie, you may be able to help us answer this. They asked what other what can be done to help. Now, because this school was a very large high school where my kids went, LaGuardia, there was no... the 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 counselors were unable to dedicate time at that point to get helping kids get into college. So it was a lot of sort of do it yourself, but there were a lot of volunteers, graduates and alumni who came in to help with the process. There are people here who want to know what kind of, will volunteering, can adults go to school and help and, and volunteer in, in schools like these um, to, to help students through this really difficult process? Any thoughts on that? I mean, I, on our, we have a lot of resources on our website, um, it, which is personalstatementfilm.com. For example, you know, that we're partnering with a lot of different organizations on our impact campaign, including the National College Access Network. So we have put on the link to their directory. If somebody wants to volunteer, you can find a college access organization near you. But I think we want to be talking about systemic reforms and what can we be doing yeah, volunteers are just sort of plugging a hole right Temporarily. I mean, it, of course everyone should volunteer and you can make a huge difference in someone's life by helping them with this you know fill this gap for an individual but I think we need to be talking thinking about how do we fill the college guidance gap nationally how do we elevate this conversation and I would welcome you to get in touch with me directly. I think we can come up with some ideas to really get this to be part of the conversation. People are concerned about the achievement gap, but oftentimes they're really not making the connection between the college guidance gap and how it is a major cause of the achievement gap that we are generally not talking about. We need to talk about it. We need more resources for school counseling in every school and especially in schools that are serving a majority of low-income students and students who would be the first generation in their families if, if they were to go. 95% of all students in the country say that they have college aspirations. And 9% of the lowest quartile income quartile in this country is, is getting a college degree by the time they're 24, compared to 77%. And a major reason, and we, they, it, it's, it's actually, it's a really clear solution. We know what the solution is. There's been studies that have shown you add 
one more school counselor, you increase by 10% the college going and the college completion because of more school counseling during high school. So we know what the answer is. We just need to make sure we put the support where it's needed. There's a question I am dying to ask Enoch. Enoch um, published an op-ed recently in the New York Times prompted by the admission scandal. So we do know that there are some people who found their way into some of the best schools in the country, not through the help of a guidance counselor, but through um, money and through other means that were really absolutely obnoxious. When you read about that, what was your reaction? It, 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 it struck me. You know, because um, as you guys see, Christine, the subjects, and our peers, we went through such an intense, like, mind draining, just physically draining process to get ourselves into college. Just blood, sweat, and tears. And I, and I found out, like, Julie spoke to me about it, and I was, I was, I was in awe. I was like, I, I can't believe, like, this is a thing. Like, how, how like, sick can we be, you know, as a society, you know? Like we are grinding our hearts out and only like a couple of K can get you past all that stuff. And I, I use this analogy, it was, it's the wall analogy, okay, bear with me. So I approach this wall, right, and it's a big wall and I have no assistance and no idea how to get over it, right? Just like we had, we, we lacked the knowledge of going through the college process. And I'm at this wall, I'm like, all right, I could do this. I, I, I could do it, I have no help. And I look to my left and my right, and there's these people frolicking up to the wall with ladders and like people assisting them up. And I'm like, can I get some of that? And they're like, it's 15K, please. And I didn't even bring my wallet to the wall, you know? So I, that's, what, that's how I felt. I felt like I was just absolutely clueless, and I, I wish that things like that didn't occur, you know, and I felt like my perspective and the people that I knew, I spoke for them as well. That's, that's why I started to write. Did you, Rudy, did it, did it strike you, the, the contrast between what you're seeing in the schools and the counselors who are working and, and how easy it is to just, not exactly easy, but, you know, maybe crew should have been your sport or soccer. We just could have put a little picture and instead of all that work you did on football. I'm wondering if this has come up in your conversations with counselors. I mean, yeah, I think inequity based on class is one of the most pervasive forms of inequity in this country after race, but also the least talked about inequity, right? Because I think there is this piece of getting very attached to the American dream that if you work hard enough, you will get what you want. And we know that is not the case because as Enoch is saying, there are many walls put in place for you that are meant to hold you back. Um, so I think all of us in the community were definitely appalled and unfortunately, I think within the community, there's also this piece of like, and we know it's happening, right? I mean, I think there's this, like, when a mirror's put up, you're like, oh, I can see it. And I always knew it was there. Um, but I think there is some relief, the fact that we are talking about it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one maybe good thing, right, from the college admission scandal is that everyone kind of understands how important they feel uh, it is for their children to succeed and, and how much help is needed. So if the wealthy are going out of their way at cheating, you know, and then also all of the legal things that people are doing, I think we can understand that we need to do the same for all students. But Julia, as we're, we're wrapping up soon, but as we do, I, I, I can't help but wonder for all of us who think deeply about these issues around the achievement gap and equity and, and how to make education more fair, even if we did have more guidance counselors, how do how are we going? It seems like it seems like wealthy parents, and I've seen in my reporting, will stop at nothing to get to do what it needs to do to get their kids in the more prestigious institutions. So even if you have more guidance counselors, how do we stop that? How do we make that make it more fair? So, any any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just again that I think when we were, I know we're running out of time, but it's clear the system is broken that we need to be rethinking everything about the system in order to level the playing field. In the meantime, while the system is so complicated and while college is so unaffordable, and while there are also so many sort of predatory institutions and lenders, while we have 17-year-olds making the most important decisions of their lives, we need to make sure they have the support they need to do them without getting themselves into big trouble, which is what we see uh, with so many young people who are taking loans that they can't afford, and they end up deeper 
um, in poverty than they were when they started because they tried to get to college. That, that's a really good point. And I also want to um, add something that I learned a lot from President Tom Bailey from all the years when he ran the Community College Research Center here at Teachers College. Um, it actually, BMCC came out looking great in this film, whereas Smith College, as everybody, um, a, lot, a lot of people who I've reacted to, uh, who I've seen somebody who is a Smith College graduate who saw the film with me recently said, I'm never giving them another penny. Um, so... All the um, elite, prestigious institutions and all that people do to get into them, they, um, there are other ways. There are other pathways. There are clearer ways. There are fairer um, ways to, to get an education. Um, and Enoch, just to, to, if we can, can conclude with you, anything else you'd like folks to take away from, from your experience and in, in what you saw and what you did? Well, um, I would love for everyone to understand that there are issues that are in our society that needs to have light shed on it. And just us being aware of those issues makes us better, you know? And what makes you even a, like a superhero is being the voice and trying to inform reform, you know? So I know we have the power and the ability to, and I just ask us all to commence, you know? Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our panel, ladies and gentlemen. And just so you know, there's plenty of people at Teachers College willing to help the two of you with applications so that you can come get graduate degrees here and be part of our family. Keep up the good work, guys. <laughs>